They say people don't believe in heroes anymore. Well, damn them! You and me, Max. We're gonna give them back to heroes. Do you really expect me to go for that crap? In the not-too-distant future, there will be no civilization. There will be no heroes. Rider had broken from custody and escaped in the police vehicle. You made he the was news awaiting news. arraignment on charges relating to the slaying of a main force of the officer in a road blockade accident last week. Just another glory rider, I guess. Third... That must be your friend over there. I didn't leave much of him. The Night Rider. That is his name. A code three ran down a few days ago. The uh, night rider. Yeah, night rider. Uh, got a problem. What's that? Well, his friends. The words out there. I have to get you. It's good job. Yeah, no mad trash. Mm. Well, I'll add it to my threat collection. <laughs> we know who you are, Franz. We'll see you on the road, scat. Paperwork's clean, you boys can do what you like. exploded onto the big screen in Australia the 12th of April 1979. It hit the UK in November and made its way to the USA in March of 1980. Produced for a small budget of just over 350,000 Australian dollars, it made a huge profit worldwide totaling $100 million, which was a world record for the time. It was one of the most profitable movies ever made owing to its low budget. With it being shot in Australia and containing an Aussie cast, the US distributors American International Pictures decided to dub the movie, as they felt audiences wouldn't understand the dialogue and terminology. This upset the actors. They felt that if they'd known this would happen, they could have easily done an American accent. This dubbed version would often be used when it came to VHS, Laserdisc and early DVD releases. But thankfully now more focus has been placed on retaining the original audio, with the US dub being kept as a second option for people to use when watching the movie. With the movie's minimal dialogue and ambiguous location, it felt like it could be set anywhere with a dystopic future, and thus it worked for audiences around the world. Owing to Mad Max's violent scenes, it was banned in New Zealand and Sweden. The death of Goose was one scene that caused complaints, and the attack on the couple that escaped from the gang and eventually get cornered was cut in some countries. It was later shown in full in New Zealand in 1983, after the success of the sequel. Sweden eventually lifted their ban in 2005. Despite the movie being dubbed, it made Mel a huge star in the United States. Even before Mad Max was released in Australia, there was already buzz about his performance. People knew he was a superstar in the making. The director George Miller's career was also boosted, as he continued with two follow-ups in the 80s, Mad Max 2 and Beyond Thunderdome. He later moved on to other genres, proving himself a very versatile director. George returned to the Mad Max series in 2015 with Fury Road, starring Tom Hardy and Hugh Keyes Byrne, who plays Toe Cutter in Mad Max, returning as a new character called Immortan Joe. The movie proved a huge success. At 70 years old, George once again demonstrated that he was still an absolute pro when it came to action and spectacular visuals. As I'm sure many Mad Max fans know, George Miller in the 1970s was studying and working as a medical doctor, assisting in an emergency room in a hospital in Sydney, 
where he saw many injuries and deaths that would later be depicted in Mad Max. During his studies to be a doctor, George formed a production company after meeting the late Byron Kennedy in 1969 at a film course in Melbourne University. George had a keen interest in filmmaking and he used his medical career to help finance the company's productions. The duo produced two short films together, Violence in the Cinema Part 1 and The Devil in Evening Dress. They wanted to move into feature films but that dream wouldn't become a reality until 1979 when they started developing Mad Max. They met first time screenwriter James McCausland who helped them develop their story. George and James wrote a script based on the idea that people would do almost anything to keep vehicles moving and the assumption that nations would not consider the huge cost of providing infrastructure for alternative energy until it was too late. This idea was spurred on by the oil crisis in Australia of 1973. George envisioned a silent movie with only score and a simple narrative, employing highly kinetic images reminiscent of Buster Keaton and Harold Lloyd to tell its tale. Miller believed that audiences would find his violent story more believable if set in a bleak future after a world war, where society is on the brink of collapse. George and Brian needed funding and created a presentation to sell their movie. They successfully managed to secure a large chunk of the budget, but more money was needed. So George's brother Bill invested money, becoming an associate producer. George did extra emergency medical calls to help get the final budget up to 350,000 Australian dollars. When it came time to casting Mad Max, George had considered casting an American in the lead, but in an effort to keep the money down, he decided to keep with local talent. Mel Gibson and his friend Steve Bisley, who had both just graduated from the National Institute of Dramatic Arts and starred in Summer City together, auditioned for parts in the movie. Mel turned up looking a mess, as he had been in a fight the day before, and he had to read a large paragraph of dialogue. He just winged it and ad-libbed. Luckily, he got the part. He had the looks and talent to take on the lead role. His friend Steve would end up playing Max's best friend, Goose. The role of Toe Cutter went to Hugh Keyes Byrne, who had already starred in a number of movies playing smaller roles. He was a classically trained actor and when playing the part, he would change his accent. So each scene has a slightly different voice. He had just recently starred in The Man from Hong Kong, alongside Roger Ward, who would play the head of the police force. Hugh and the other actors were based in Sydney, but the production couldn't afford to fly them down to Melbourne. So they shipped out the motorbikes which had been donated by Kawasaki and the actors drove them down to Melbourne. They were already getting into character. Some of the extras were members of actual outlaw motorcycle clubs and rode their own motorcycles in the film. Originally filming was scheduled to take 10 weeks, 6 weeks for first unit and 4 weeks on stunt and chase sequences. However, 4 days into shooting, Rosie Bailey, who was originally cast as Max's wife, was injured in a bike accident. Production was halted and Bailey was replaced by TV actor Joanne Samuel. Shooting took place in and around Melbourne, using disused factories and even the Melbourne University underground car park. Max's house was located near the coast of Australia and is still there to this day apparently. It's rented out as a holiday home. Miller described the whole experience as guerrilla filmmaking, where the cast would close roads without filming permits, didn't use walkie-talkies because their frequencies coincided with the police radio, and after filming was done, Miller and Kennedy would even sweep down the roads. There was little money to pay the crew, they worked long hours and many of the stunt team were just given large amounts of beer instead of money. Some of the crew expressed frustration with George due to his lack of experience and not getting enough shots done within the day. There was a lot of improvisation going on and a lot of the scenes weren't storyboarded so nobody had a clear idea what was going to be shot on the day. Because of the film's low budget, all but one of the police uniforms in the film were made of vinyl leather with only one genuine leather uniform made for Mel Gibson. Mel later said in an interview that his suit wasn't leather so it's hard to know if they actually did spend the money on his outfit. I'm guessing the former and thinking Mel may have not realised at the time. For the vehicles, they had three police cars and two black interceptors based around the Ford Falcon. The yellow interceptors could barely push over 60 miles per hour, but you wouldn't know as they managed to put the camera in the right spot to give it that sense of speed. The most memorable car, Max's Black Pursuit Special, was a 1973 V8 powered Ford Falcon GT351, a car predominantly exclusive to the Australian market. The Falcon has a great lineage dating all the way back to 1960 and was only discontinued as a model in 2016. The main modifications are the Concorde style front end, 8 side mounted exhaust pipes and the supercharger protruding through the bonnet. This was not functional I'm afraid and only done for its looks. Superchargers also cannot be engaged and disengaged at the driver's will, despite how it's portrayed in the film. By the end of filming, 14 vehicles had been destroyed in the chase and crash scenes, including George Miller's own Mazda Bongo, the small blue van that spins out of control near the beginning. To help make it light enough to spin, they stripped out the engine.
with the film's story, it's set in the not too distant future. The world is on the brink of collapse. A townspeople are being terrorised by a group of bikers led by Toe Cutter. After the death of one of his gang, Knight Rider, they want revenge on the local police, who are struggling to cope with the high crime rates and deaths. Max's partner Goose is targeted by the gang and taken out by the rebellious Johnny. He is left severely burned, which causes Max to lose the confidence to do his job and he needs to get away. He takes a break with his wife and child and escapes to the country, but they run into Toe Cutter and his gang who gruesomely kill his young family. Max is pushed to return to his duties as he struggles to maintain his sanity. He suits up and takes the new V8 Interceptor. He is no longer Max, he is Mad Max. The late composer Brian May composed a score to Mad Max and would return to provide the music to the Road Warrior, but sadly not for Beyond Thunderdome. Brian came to George Miller's attention thanks to his work on the 1978 film Patrick. May's score resembled the work of Bernard Herrmann. George wanted a big symphonic score that had energy and bite to it. The score became a combination of classic orchestrations and mechanical sounds, giving the film a huge soundscape, complementing the highly charged chase scenes and dystopian future backdrop. The score does also have an emotional core to it, with its love theme for Max and his wife. This is a lush theme that incorporates a slice of jazz, with its use of a saxophone. This could possibly be my favourite piece of music in the film. You could argue the score in some places doesn't fit the direction the movie is going in, but overall it does complement many of the visuals. I think composers today working on a movie such as this would have the score be very minimal and played down in the mix to create an unsettling atmosphere, but this was 1979 and the direction was to have this big score full of character and loud in the sound mix. Now sometimes the score is a bit too loud, often drowning out the dialogue. Due to its budget limitations they couldn't afford the newly released audio encoding of Dolby Stereo, so they used the traditional mono soundtrack and I get the impression that the individuals involved with the sound mix were struggling to balance the audio. Either that or the recording of the dialogue just wasn't very good, so you have a lot of inconsistent levels of sound effects, dialogue and music all fighting for airtime in the mix. There is a moment when a police officer arrives to meet Max and his wife, they discover a severed hand on their car and the music just overpowers what they are saying. It sounds like music for a chase sequence but slapped over a regular piece of dialogue it's such an odd creative choice on behalf of Miller and May. There are other moments where the dialogue is so inaudible, you have to play it back to double check what they said. This is not the fault of Aussie accents, but the poor quality of the dialogue recording. The score was issued on LP in 1980 with 31 minutes of music. It didn't get a CD release until 1993, which featured one extra track of outtakes, additional music cues and sound effects. Due to the renewed popularity of LP, it got a limited re-release in 2017. This was identical to the 1993 CD version, and the music wasn't further expanded upon. The CD release is currently very pricey on the second-hand market, but thankfully it's available on iTunes for £8, and definitely worth picking up. Brian May's work on Mad Max 1 and 2 is superb, and their respective scores work wonderfully by themselves. But if you had to compare the two, I would say the first film has the edge. A lot of the themes were carried over into the sequel, but it was missing the emotional music that comes with Mad Max 1. I saw the first Mad Max in full way after I'd seen Mad Max 2 and Beyond Thunderdome. At that point I was familiar with the world of the sequels and seeing the first movie, it felt like the odd one out. As a kid I recall seeing the big black Warner Brothers rental tape and thinking how awesome the cover was, but this was an 18 rated movie and I would never get a chance to see it till I was older, so I just rented Superman 3 instead for like the fifth time. I was 7 years old, give me a break. The original 1979 movie, in my eyes, is a non-stop chase action sci-fi adventure. Its science fiction is a bit loose, and it doesn't do a particularly good job of setting up the world. You have this distant future setting, but it seems very much isolated to this large town that is surrounded by a lot of open land. There is an obvious disconnect from the world, but society hasn't fully crumbled like the sequels. In a more recent interview, George Miller said that was not the intention when the script was written, to set it in a post-apocalyptic world. This was done because they didn't have the money for extras and properly maintained buildings. In order to cover for this production value limitation, the title card was added to the beginning, explaining that the story was set in the distant future. This also accounts for why there is more an established society in this movie. Come the sequel, it kind of retcons the series and gives a little more story to establish the world and how society has fallen apart. 
Although the writer's intent was to comment on the oil crisis of the 70s, there isn't much of a reflection of that in the movie. The sequel really pushed that idea and oil becoming gold to them as everyone fights for it. You only see them once in the first movie near the end, trying to steal petrol. The action and chase scenes are spectacular and very well shot for the time. This is really the movie's selling point. There are some tense moments when a child walks into the middle of the road and narrowly avoids being run over. This was made during a time of optical effects and blue screen, but owing to their low budget, there are no optical techniques employed. Everything is done for real. The cinematographer David Egby captures some daring shots that today would be probably impossible to do due to health and safety regulations. Very low camera shots were achieved by the cameraman riding on a bike as a passenger holding and operating the camera while traveling at top speed. A lot of the shots were improvised on the day and despite this, there are no reflections of the camera operators in the cars or mirrors. Seeing a car being propelled at ridiculous high speeds by a military rocket is something that hadn't been done before and probably not since. In one shot you see a stuntman get whacked by the wheel of a bike as he comes off his own motorbike on the bridge. He gets clobbered by the wheel as it slides across the floor. It's all left in shot. Thankfully the stuntman just got up and walked away after the take. The movie is like a wonderful showreel for the director and the stunt team involved. Very professionally done, despite its crude nature and filming methods. The movie has themes of friendship, tragedy and revenge all happening in this hostile world. Revenge is very much its main theme, however, as Max is driven over the edge to hunt down and kill Toecutter and his gang by the murder of his friend and family. The story is pretty straightforward, but for me it doesn't really hold itself together to tell a smooth and overall satisfying experience. This is not to say I don't like it, far from it, but it feels a little unfocused and all its attention is on the action. The DP nicely put it as a script in moments rather than an actual story. There are odd plot holes and things that aren't made entirely clear. The gang leave Johnny at the side of the road after they attack the couple. Then Tokata wants Johnny back after he is arrested. Maybe they left him due to his crazy like behaviour, but it isn't made clear why they decided to do that. What is consistent however and clear is Max's story and his overall arc in the movie. We see a confident guy who begins to struggle with the job and needs to get away after the loss of his best friend. He warns his superior that he'll go crazy if he stays on the road any longer. He's finally pushed over the edge by the loss of his child and his wife being badly injured and becomes Mad Max. This is for me when the movie becomes really interesting. I like how Max is hunting down the gang and eventually finds Johnny to get his revenge. I think there could have been more of a face-off between Max and Toe Cutter, as Toe Cutter is taken out pretty quickly once Max is on his tail, but this is a minor nitpick. Mel Gibson looks totally cool and calm throughout the movie. He easily falls into the role and deftly portrays the emotions the character required. He shows the anger, the loss and the love of his friends and wife, hitting all the emotional beats effortlessly. But when he gets shot by the gang and falls to the ground, seeing him struggle to stand up and slowly crawl to his car looks so real. Mel makes it look very painful and shows even his acting skills on a physical level are to a high standard. If I'd seen the series in order, I would probably have a stronger appreciation for this film, but in the situation I'm in, with it being the last one in the Mel Gibson trilogy I watched, sadly I find it the weakest of the series. Now there's not a huge drop off in its level of quality, Thunderdome has its problems, but there are stronger themes and ideas in that film, whereas the 1979 film doesn't have a full clear vision. I like the world George Miller created for Mad Max 2. George had not intended to make a trilogy at the time, and he never planned a follow up to Mad Max, so when it came to doing a sequel, they wanted to try something different. Each one, therefore, has a loose connection to the last, but there wasn't that intention from the outset in an official capacity. Even in regards to the latest one, George says it's set after Thunderdome, but there are moments in the film that don't make that entirely clear. Despite saying all this, I would still recommend the first Mad Max. It's easy to get hold of if you haven't seen it, it's available in box sets, and more recently a Shout Factory Collector's Edition Blu-ray, which is the one I would recommend. It contains a decent amount of special features, and presents the original sound mix in 5.1 DTS audio. It's not a brilliant new mix however, but gives you the option to have the Australian version or US dub depending on your preference. In light of this being George's first feature film, I'd say that he pulls it off and demonstrates his skills behind the camera with a slick visual style. The majority of the shots have a great industrial backdrop, which creates an unfamiliar setting, and the editing is top notch with a great use of cross dissolves as he cuts from one location to another. It shows off his energetic style but also shows that he can do the quieter and more tender moments. As with all directors who move from short films to feature films, it's never a smooth transition, and Mad Max definitely has those issues with its storytelling. Come Mad Max 2, George is totally confident in his ability as a visual storyteller and filmmaker. 
Mad Max is a B-movie with aspirations above its station. Its crudeness complements it, but ultimately it's not a perfect film, and not entirely original. It's a great piece of Australian cinema, and it gave us a preview of the new talent coming from Australia that would eventually make it to Hollywood and flaunt their skills on a bigger scale. So full of living, you know? We ran the franchise on it. Now there's nothing. And here I am, trying to put sense to it. And I know there isn't any. I'll be all right once I get it clear of my head. I'm scared, thief. You know why? That mad circus out there. I'm beginning to enjoy it. What is this, Bunny Week? Look, any longer out on that road and I'm one of them, you know? A terminal crazy. Only I got a bronze badge to say I'm one of the good guys. You asshole! What the molly frog do you think you're doing? You and me are gonna talk about the toe cutter. I'll say the names. If you say yes or no. Night Rider. <laughs> Toe cutter. Love and There's more. It's like Johnny. Johnny the boy. It's us. Where? The beach are looking for fuel. Are they coming back? I don't know. They gotta get their punch. If you enjoyed the video don't forget to like and subscribe. If you want to gain early access to my retrospective reviews, episodes of Fix It In Post and commentary podcasts, you can pledge to my Patreon. Thank you.